summer, so this is super that everybody's here. Um, tonight we have uh, the following speakers, Brian Wood and Anna Gastovich, um, both of whom are at the UC Berkeley uh, web platform services team. Uh, Brian is an applications programmer uh, in IST and is the technical lead on the IST Drupal team responsible for Berkeley's Drupal distribution. Anna is a web and accessibility specialist, uh, graduate from UC Santa Cruz, has been at Berkeley since 2005, currently works for IST in the same group, uh, also in the Drupal uh, web and accessibility team. Brian will describe how web platform services leverage AWS services like EC2 and SQS to automate software updates for Open Berkeley websites. And Anna will discuss how the web platform services team is able to build on the cloud strategy and offer a robust turnkey service for a variety of audiences and provide marvelous customer support with limited resources. Um, our next speaker is Mayank Malik. He is uh, currently the chief data officer and blockchain lead at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, from his LinkedIn account, he describes uh, the following. He's a cultivator of new technologies, designer of experiences, gardener extraordinaire. I've seen that in practice. Um, touring uh, Slack has little garden plots that you can, that you can uh, grow your own things at. Uh, he's a big geek, consumer of chocolates, occasional chef, pragmatist, rational, passionate about education, numbers guy with an appetite for complexity. So really um, very excited to have these speakers here tonight. Uh, we'll have the two, uh, we'll have uh, Brian and Anna speak first, and then we'll do a, a transition for my own. And then at the end, we'll have a big question and answer session. So try to hold your questions um, to the end there. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Catherine Carson, who's the faculty head of data sciences, education, and a professor of history, and Carolyn Burnett, who is the Skydeck executive director. Uh, there are a number of co-organizers uh, co who make this event possible, including Amy Neeser from Research IT, Anthony Swen in the Division of Data Sciences, uh, Sybil Shen, the Program Director at Skydeck, and Gordon Pang, Program Coordinator, um, also at Skydeck. So, um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sybil, uh, who will uh, welcome us to Skydeck. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm Sybil Chen, I'm the Senior Director at Skydeck. Um, by a quick show of hands, how many of you are here for the first time? Okay, a few of you guys. Well, welcome. Uh, so for those of you that are just visiting us for the very first time, a quick kind of overview about Skydeck. Um, we always like to give a, a little plug, so as you meet founders that might be great for Skydeck, you can kind of share a little bit. We have 145 startups come through our program and accelerator every six months. This most recent fall 2019 uh, cohort started in July, and they're with us through February. And the six-month program usually ends with Demo Day, which is on campus at Poly Ballroom. Um, we have three major tracks, an accelerator track, it's about 25 companies, an incubator track called Hot Dust, which is about 100 companies. We also have global innovation partner companies that are sent to us by our partner um, global accelerators around the world. Uh, so we have a lot of companies here. It's Usually, if you come during the daytime, it's very, very busy. Um, we always welcome, we have an open door policy. Any of you guys that know founders that are interested in potentially you know, participating in our program, feel free to always you know, surface those founders to our attention. We're always happy to chat with them and talk to them and help them. So anyways, with that, thank you guys for making your way out here, and uh, thank you to all the other coordinators. Enjoy. My name is Anna. This is my coworker Brian. A uh, quick overview as far as what our team is, Web Platform Services. We are the Open Berkeley team. That's the website solution that we're going to speak about shortly. We are also the, the campus web accessibility team. So if you have questions about how to make your website or product accessible, <coughs> please come talk to us. Uh, we also facilitate the campus relationship with Pantheon, our external hosting partner for Drupal and WordPress websites. So. Really quickly, um, just a little bit about our website platform, just some background. Many site owners and 
UC Berkeley campus websites in general are taken care of by campus communication or administrative teams. They may or may not have a technical background. So our team's focus and sort of our value proposition is to take care of the security, accessibility, and maintenance of all of our sites. And as it's sort of a turnkey service that site owners and builders can sort of offload the technical aspects onto us and they can focus instead just on their content. We also incorporate the campus branding standards into our website into a ready to use theme and generally speaking, easy to use widgets and other options. So I would have passed over to Frank. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, actually I want to start by how many people are not familiar with the basic resources available on AWS, like if we're talking about AWS SQS, SNS, is that just alphabet soup or I'm just wondering how much, it sounds like I can talk in a lot of acronyms and it's cool, but let me know if uh, I'm losing you. I was, I'm hoping to just tell you the story of a solution and it's kind of a, not a highly technical solution just right down the middle of the road, hopefully demonstrating basically correct use of use of Amazon uh, Web Service Resources. Um, as uh, Anna mentioned, we our main product is uh, a content, a customized content management website um, that uh, is uh, delivered with all the correct branding and accessibility. Um, and uh, we manage 170 websites right now, and uh, it's based on uh, the Drupal content management system. Every Wednesday is a release window for Drupal security updates, and those releases uh, are likely to impact our system in one way or another. And uh, one of the core values of our service is uh, rapid deployment of security updates. And so this is the problem that I want to talk about. Um, how do we get uh, updates to 170 different sites? So I thought I'd start by um, talking about uh, the tools we have available. And um, and uh, the first one is our hosting service is Pantheon, as Anna mentioned. And Pantheon is a Drupal and WordPress specific uh, hosting provider. They um, provide a, a dashboard UI for the dev, test, and production versions of uh, your website. and. Uh, they also provide the ability to connect your dev environment to what they call an upstream repository. And um, that, when that repository has commits in it that um, don't exist on your dev environment, you um, can deploy them by clicking a button. And then you can move them um, across each environment up to live. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we need to do when um, the security releases are issued. Um, so, uh, as Anna mentioned, we really want to keep our clients focused on creating content, presenting content, not the technical aspects of running a website. And uh, this means that they don't get access to the Pantheon dashboard, so we can't just say, okay, go click that button, everybody. Um, in, and it also would be pretty inefficient for us to go to every dashboard and, and click the buttons for them. Uh, so. There is another tool in the mix, uh, which is called Terminus. It's a command line tool uh, made available by Pantheon. It's, uh, it's analogous to the Docker CLI or the AWS CLI. Basically, anything you can do to a website on Pantheon, you can do um, at the command line with this tool. It's also super useful for um, scripting or automating stuff. Um, so um, our early solution, um, uh, was built, we decided we needed our own command line tool for um, managing um, the different operations we need to do, like bringing up a new site, or in this case, upgrading a new site. So um, we, uh, we, uh, sorry, I lost my train here. So we, um, we did, basically our tool um, takes terminus commands and, um, and runs them in such an order that comprises what we've de determined the best practice for upgrading our product. And uh, that this is a list of the basic steps that are taken. Um, and you can see, you know, the first thing we do is uh, make some backups and, and stuff like that, and then we deploy things. And there's some repetition here. Um, so. Uh, Our, um, in the early days of this tool, we would, uh, this tool is that it can up, 
update one single site, and uh, the uh, and so so basically in the early days of the tool, we would divvy up uh, the sites we had, which were maybe like 15 or 20 between our team members. We'd all open up a bunch of terminal windows, we'd run the command, and we'd pour over the output and, and look to see if anything went wrong. Um, and and uh, obviously that uh, doesn't scale very well either, so it wasn't long before we needed to turn to um, better, uh, more automated, more scalable service. Uh, so if anyone wants to hear about my modeling tool, I can tell them about it afterwards. Uh, <laughs> this is like the crown jewel slide, and I didn't have very much time to create this, and I was like, I try and do this the right way. So anyways, uh, basically, I thought I'd walk you through um, what actually happens when we do an update um, now with, uh, with what we've built. Uh, we will do the testing needed on the released code, and uh, one of our team members will um, run a Q command, which sends um, a list of sites. We've divided our sites into cohorts um, based on the criticality of uptime or the complexity of features and things like that. So we'll be running through a co cohort. The, uh, the our, our tool will take that list and create um, messages um, that can be sent to SQS, which is Amazon's Q service. And um, then the um, Amazon CloudWatch um, is capable of responding to events that happen on Amazon infrastructure. So CloudWatch can um, detect that there is now a message in this queue, and based on that, I should raise an alarm, and that alarm um, can uh, trigger a scale-out function by uh, the auto-scaling service. Auto the most common thing you use auto-scaling for is bringing up EC2 instances, and so um, the auto scaling service launches an EC2 instance. That instance is built um, using an image, and, um, and we created the image using Packer, which is an open source tool uh, by HashiCorp. Um, they, uh, it, it basically allows you to create the same thing, it's very analogous to a Docker file, um, to uh, create a recipe specifying what uh, software should be on your server and, um, and to some extent configuration. So. Our image contains our code, um, plus terminus, plus SSH keys needed to connect to Pantheon, plus um, uh, a cron tab, um, which, uh, which helps uh, the code uh, know when to retrieve messages. So every couple of minutes, uh, the code will retrieve 30 messages from the queue and spin up 30 simultaneous processes. Each process is upgrading one site, so we can get through 170 pretty soon, um, or more efficiently, obviously, than, than uh, one at a time. Um, and let's see here. So as, that, as the updates run, um, the code uh, has the ability to write directly to an S3 bucket. Um, the AWS SDK uh, provides a stream wrapper. So that's pretty convenient. So all of the updates go into a bucket that's named according to the update we're doing. And um, then the uh, terminus commands get sent to the Pantheon API and, uh, and tasks happen on the uh, Pantheon container, which, uh, which is the web server for the website. Um, so the, the, where the rubber hits the road in a system like this is the ability to uh, respond to unexpected events or error conditions that happen um, during a process. And uh, the error conditions that we run into fall into two basic categories. Um, the first is that the Pantheon API, when it's um, under stress, uh, will respond slowly or respond with an error or not respond at all occasionally. They've gotten a lot better. Um, recently, but there's also been some very critical uh, security updates that have come out for Drupal, and people worldwide will all be scrambling to apply them at the same time. So um, the first thing that we did um, in response to that was when we run a, a terminus command, we run it in its own process, a child process, and we monitor that process. It has a timeout that we can respond to if the command doesn't come back. We can also can respond to output of the command um, and determine, oh, it's a, it's a non-success state. And then of, of those non-success states, we can, um, 
we have we know which ones are retriable, and a, a large percentage of the of the API errors are retriable. And so the way we handle that is the um, the we will remove the message from the queue. We, we will say we grab this message from the queue, but we're actually removing it now. And then we'll update the attributes on it. And the attributes are just little chunks of data. And we'll say like, okay, the message failed at step five. Um, so that was the failure step. And we're sending it back to the queue. The queue is configured with a visibility timeout, which means when it receives a new message, that message um, will, uh, uh, not be visible to uh, to a command trying to retrieve it for 15 minutes or whatever you configure, because we don't want to retry the same site you know in rapid su succession. We want to give the uh, infrastructure a chance to recover from whatever's happening and also distribute our resources across all of our sites and try to get as many upgraded as possible at once. Um, so. Um, the other, uh, the other type of error that we run into aside from API errors is just a basic error happening in the website database or in the code registry or, um, or one of a number of different conflicts. And these are harder errors which we can't retry and usually require human intervention. So they're moved to a, um, a failed queue um, for uh, human processing later. So, um, one of, one of the other things um, along the lines of the API, um, uh, when the API is under stress, is often we can predict that based on what we're seeing. Um, and we can queue cohorts with attributes that have flags like minimal or quick. And these will skip uh, certain non-critical steps uh, in the update process. For example, it's great to have a, a backup that was created just a minute ago, but if push comes to shove, we can rely on the backup that was scheduled six hours ago, um, that kind of thing. And those uh, those switches have helped us um, get the, all the sites updated when um, when things are really uh, ugly <laughs> in terms of performance on Pantheon. Um, uh, so let's see, we've talked about the two different kinds of errors. Um, so the, the, the next big thing is how do we tell what's going on? Well, um, basically monitoring. The, the, the first uh, small uh, small thing I did in terms of monitoring was uh, let's just uh, make available some information about what's going on with the queues. So you know, here's, uh, here's output of a status command that allows us to see, okay, there's you know 30 processing right now, there's 43 that can be picked up, and there's 13. But this is of limited use because really we're more interested in like what sites are processing and what sites have had problems. Um, so um, the next thing we did was uh, hooking up uh, uh, AWS to Slack. Um, and uh, we thought, oh yeah, we'll just have a Slack queue showing what's going on with our updates. Everything will be fine and dandy. Well, um, this worked pretty well. Um, and as you can see, we, we send uh, notifications like when people queue sites, uh, that update requeue is a site being retried. Um, the success is, uh, you know, obviously a success. The links there take you directly to um, your log file on S3 if you have permission. Um, and uh, this worked pretty well, except the shortcomings uh, were that uh, as we got more and more sites, we'd start saying like, okay, so you know, site A started here, and where did it finish? And we'd be scrolling through, oh, it finished there, and like, let's check the log file there, and there was a lot of scrolling back and forth. And then one of our, our most meticulous uh, teammates, actually our fearless leader, uh, would take it upon herself to scan every single log file at the end of an update to make sure that there wasn't some warning or error condition that wasn't surfaced um, by Slack that we should know about. And uh, that bothered me a lot, <laughs> not because it was the wrong thing to do, just that she had to do that. And so um, we, the next generation of monitoring, this might be a little hard to see, um, but uh, the next generation was uh, another um, CLI-based tool, as you can see. And it's, it, it, I wanted to capture the whole thing just to show how much data is there. Um, <laughs> And it basically gives you, you know, summaries of where we're at the update, how many have finished, uh, how many have failed, what's still left, 
and then it surfaces, you know, which ones have requeued, and then that list at the very bottom is like, here are, here are interesting um, warning conditions that should probably be reviewed, and the tool allows you to drill down into those. So that looks kind of impressive in that there's a lot of lines and letters and numbers and stuff, but behind the scenes it's actually pretty simple. All that's happening is the tool is just downloading the entire S3 bucket to the user's temp directory, parsing all the logs, and then aggregating this data in a way that's useful. Um, but, uh, and, and this is still pretty quick and dirty. It's like there's not even a release number on it. I just got it done to alleviate this problem of looking at all the logs. But it's, of all the things I've done, I've realized it's been one of the more um, useful things. And sometimes uh, not, not waiting for the perfect solution is a good way of, of going about things. Uh, so, and the final thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, we've been using this for a while. It served us really well, uh, but we are working on a next generation. And the things that I'm focusing on are moving um, away from EC2 and towards ECS. And so we've dockerized our command line tool. You, we will be able to run it in exactly the same environment on a laptop or on uh, EC2. And, um, and also um, another thing that I really want to achieve is getting all of our AWS configuration into CloudFormation um, because uh, the shortcut I took before was downloading a bunch of JSON and like putting it in a repository and putting in some notes and it just doesn't, uh, it's better than nothing but it's not good enough um, to recreate an environment if you need to. So um, that's everything I have. I, I hope it's been useful, a useful little tour and uh, thank you very much for listening. basically covered how AWS allows us to deploy all these updates really rapidly and monitor the status, but Bill Allison asked us to talk specifically how we build on that cloud strategy in order to provide this robust turnkey service. So that's kind of what I'm here to talk about. And I just was reminiscing on the days before all the awesome automation work, how I think my record was like eight terminal windows I was able to open up in one display, and I think that was far too unwieldy, so we far prefer uh, Brian's latest and greatest methods. Um, so just to bring this into sort of a real world concept, we wanted to mention that even with a strong cloud strategy, the customer experience really matters if a product or a service is going to succeed. So my sort of take on this, um, so this, these are all sort of completely unsolicited quotes that we've received from customers in their email communications with us. I say these not to brag, but maybe to brag a little bit <laughs> because they are unsolicited and they make us really happy. Um, but it was mostly my way of mentioning that since we can focus on the customer experience so much due to our cloud strategy, we found that this customer success and empowerment leads to a really positive culture. And we think that's a very important goal for any product or service. So just to give you an overview though, even with this strong cloud strategy, we do often have a full plate and a lot of competing priorities. So we try to focus on a customer support system that's efficient without comp like compromising the customer experience. So just to go into a little bit of an overview of what that looks like. So from our perspective, we've been able to kind of break down our customer support system into four tiers. We have the training sessions, and I should say all of these four sort of items kind of all complement each other in one way or another. And our customers can kind of either utilize all of them or take a sampling from them as based on what their needs are in order to use our platform. So, we have our formal training sessions. Those are once a month. That's where we show you how to get started with the platform and how to continue to build your site. We have very detailed online documentation, everything that's covered in the training sessions and beyond. We are really pre like, pretty happy with our ability to provide really robust email support to our customers, and that's the first line of contact with our customers to our team. And that means being careful about being very detailed and helpful without replicating what we've already detailed in our online documentation. So those two definitely work in tandem. And then what kind of brings it all together in the end are our more informal, informal office hours experiences. And that's once a month and it's basically our team is there, any all questions are allowed and we're there to help give you the one-on-one -on -one support for your site. And we found essentially these things, it kind of fills in the gaps as to where we might, that might exist within this system of customer support. So just, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about accessibility because we're also the accessibility team. We consider it sort of a non-negotiable aspect since it's UC policy. Our platform is accessible out of the box. Um, if you're familiar with Site Improve scores, our website platform scores a 99 out of the box on Site Improve. 
and then, but customers are still responsible for the accessibility of their content, right? So we include accessibility in context with everything, with all of our customer support elements, tiers, et cetera. But uh, I want to do something fun just to end this on. Um, so because our service empowers users to better understand our user, we, we sort of abstracted our typical user or customer personas into characters from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I want us to take a step back and I want us to envision if Open Berkeley existed in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, how would they leverage our customer support tools in order to succeed with our platform when they're not busy saving the world, of course. So, we're going to start with our non-tech savvy. Oh, before I even get into this, I should say these are all based on real people in one way or another, OK? So uh, our non-tech savvy user is, of course, Captain America, since he's been frozen for like 70 years, so he can't really help it, right? So he needs regular help, but he's up for the challenge. And he, in order to utilize our customer support tools, he'd attend training probably twice to get some extra help on that. He'd email and he'd consult our guides regularly, and he'd also attend our office hours often to get the assistance he needs. Up next is our communications specialist, Captain Marvel. She's the all-around badass, busy with many responsibilities. She's been around for a really long time on the campus. She knows how everything goes. She's seen everything. So she'd attend training once. She'd be pretty self-sufficient thanks to our really thorough online documentation. And then she'd come to office hours like once or twice a year just to check in on how things are going. Uh, our next person, our student worker one, is Black Widow. She needs little help. She wastes no time. She works on lots of different projects, lots of irons in the fire. She'd probably just sit in the back during training and work on her laptop at the same time. She'd put her site together at blazing speed. She'd pretty much never need to consult guides or come to office hours. And she'd really just email if something's not working. <laughs> on the flip side, we have our second student worker, Spider-Man. He is polite and very eager to please, but he needs a little more guidance and a little more focus. So he'll attend training. He'll take dutiful notes. He can, he'll consult guides as needed. He'll email pretty often. And he'll take his time building the website. And he'll come to office hours probably every other month to, to check in and get some help. Our software engineer is Black Panther. He has all the latest technology. He doesn't often work with other units, but he uses our platform so he can concentrate on his other projects. So he'd attend training. He'd consult guides and emails. If something's not clear, he probably wouldn't need to attend office hours because he's got that in the bag. Last but certainly not least is our IT specialist, Iron Man. He's the jack of all trades, builds his own products, but he uses our platform again so he can focus on his more time consuming projects. He'd attend training and ask lots of questions because he's curious and has lots of opinions. He'd email regularly with questions and thoughts and suggestions. And he probably wouldn't need to attend office hours, but maybe he would just to chat and just to learn. So, I guess this means our team is Nick Fury in the scenario, but I'd like to think we're a little less intimidating. So I'm going to go ahead and say that maybe we could be Goose the Cat instead. <laughs> questions now for Brian, because I don't know if Brian and I can stay for the whole thing. Yeah, go ahead. Let's do okay, that. do you guys have questions for either Brian or myself? No, that's easy. No, okay. <laughs> no, okay, go ahead. Well, yeah. Real quick question. Brian's uh, about his one of the slides. Of, uh, there's something like SNS. Like, SNS? Yeah, what was that? SNS is a simple notification service, and I actually kind of uh, glossed over that. Um, there should have been, uh, yeah, basically, the um, code sends a, a, me a message to an SNS topic, and the topics um, then um, can send email, they can um, do various things. In order to get it to Slack, at least back when I was doing it, I had to use AWS Lambda. Lambda is a serverless solution for running like small bits of code. Um, it's great, actually, people do amazing things just with Lambda and never have to use EC2. And, uh, and there's like a Node.js script running there that just uh, forwards the uh, notification on to the Slack API. So that so SNS is kind of your clearinghouse for sending messages to various places, email, Slack, or where whatever else you can think of. Is SNS running under Lambda? Sorry. Uh, no, SNS is a is a resource that is provided by AWS. It's it's on the same par as uh, Lambda. They're both services that can be used. Um, so there's a class to departments who give you the, their website so that you can launch uh, it. 
Yeah, I should mention my part of this presentation was a part of a larger presentation I did where I did go into some of these details. But yeah, it's basically a subscription service for a flat fee every month for both hosting and maintenance from our basically for our team's efforts. Oh yeah, it's $100 a month, 102 essentially. $20 for hosting, $82 for maintenance. And if somebody has a current site but want, but want to hand it over to you and can, you know, uh, have it, the accessibility part ma uh, maintained by you, that's possible? So there's two different questions there. If you wanted to evaluate your existing site for accessibility, we can do that via clinics, and I can point you to the, you can just go to the Web Access website and it's got all the details there. If you did want to use our platform, it would be probably rebuilding your site on our platform, but um, we can certainly chat about that if you would like. Uh, do you expect to save money switching from easy to DCS? Like what's driving? Uh, it's more, um, it's it's more that the uh, tool is growing and it makes sense to run the tool um, in a Docker container anyways. It's kind of becoming a best practice as far as I can tell, though I wouldn't call myself an expert. Um, and Docker also allows us to like do things like build the Docker image with uh, the specific version of the terminus uh, you know program that we need and and if other um, dependencies come into play I don't have to worry does Anna have the right version of terminus is, or you know why are things going wrong so that's the basic motivation um, the, the money thing I haven't looked into so I'd, I'll be interested to learn or if anyone has Experience. I thought that Pantheon had an automatic update to Drupal. Was that true? Or? Not for Drupal. WordPress does have an automatic updates uh, feature um, that I am not um, terribly um, familiar with. And Pantheon is definitely working on like further streamlining the update process. Um, and I've talked to them a bunch about, about it. Uh, they tell, they keep telling me all the stuff you're doing. You, you're not going to need to do it. You know, you can like you haven't stopped doing that. You know, but uh, until I actually see a demonstration of something that <laughs> shows me how I can stop doing it, I, I think we'll, we'll keep on. Also, it's just a lot of fun to to, to, <laughs> to automate stuff. Um, and yeah, the devils in the details. Like, there's a lot of things that we can react to um, using our approach that I don't know if it's going to be possible. You know, with just a turnkey solution. Yeah. So yeah, I had to step away because I got a call. But so if there's a problem with Pantheon, that's when you brought it right into the log, and that's on EC, I guess, on EC2 or, um, and, and then that's the log that you parse to figure out which contents did not get updated. Um, so the, the log files are generally uh, just a log file of how the update went. So they're written regardless. And um, there, there is, um, there's classes in the code that um, take care of uh, identifying um, what happened with a specific call to the Pantheon API. Um, and when, when we detect some kind of error, the call didn't come back, call came back with some sort of error, then we respond to that by requeuing the site and retrying it if appropriate or or just failing the site if it needs human intervention. Yep. Great. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
Um, and that's not the problem either. <laughs> They have a lot of work. They have assignments that they are trying to finish. They are trying to meet the objectives that we set for them. Uh, they are trying to get good grades. They are trying to graduate. And that's the problem. Right? They graduate. They're smart and they actually graduate and they leave. And they have data and code and biases and assumptions they made when they worked on our projects. And we lose those things when they leave. <clears throat> so the question is, that's the problem. How do we solve that problem? And the simple answer is, Mike, why don't, why don't you just hire them on graduation? <laughs> so, right? like we can just do that. And we tried that, and we found that it's incredibly challenging to do that because when gra they graduate and leave, they have two options, right? They can either make a ton of money by working with somebody who helps them click on, make people click on more ads, <laughs> or they can work for little money and help us save the planet. And many of these students have student loans, they have financial obligations, and they choose to work on things that make people click on more ads. So we couldn't really solve the problem by hiding them. We are not compelling enough. So the student's gone. With them, sometimes the data sets are gone. The assumptions they made to process that data are gone. The biases they had in their data sets are not well understood. The models they built, we sometimes have them, we sometimes don't. The code sometimes is there, sometimes it's not. And inferences and results are in publications which are meaningless, particularly for AI and machine learning based research. For anybody who's working in that domain, research paper means nothing without the code in the data. You can't reproduce, and that's the end of the scientific foundation that they would have built. You have to rebuild that knowing what they did, which is there's no way to do because they're helping people click on ads. Um, so we examined the student toolkit. And the student toolkit looks a lot like there's some Jupyter notebooks, there's some Excel files, CSV files, um, there are some visualizations, maybe PDFs of visualizations, multiple versions of Jupyter notebooks, and a desk under their, like the theoretical desk under their laptop, maybe their laptop, like, and it's all gone, right? None of that exists. So we decided we need to do something simple, right? We have to just build continuity between the students. Students come in, one set of students come in, they build something, they graduate and next set of students come in. So we need to have somebody on staff who can help us build the continuity. And then we need to have technology in place that allows us to have that continuity in our te technology systems. So that's great, we can do that. So who do we need? Who do we need to hire in the team to have that continuity, right? We just need a data scientist who can write some software. We need a data scientist who can write software. And that's incredibly difficult, right? That's incredible. <laughs> Not, not just because it's a lot of skills to fit into one person's head, but because it's not clear what a data scientist is. Many people throw this term around like data science. <laughs> they talk about it as if they know what it is, but it's, it's, it's unclear, right? So at, a, at a very fundamental level, right? If you think about what a data scientist is, it is somebody who can take a bunch of data and infer a lot of information or knowledge from it. That's fair enough. But if you were to go a little bit deeper into examining that statement, you'll find a continuum of skills. And the continuum goes from software engineering on one side to research scientists on the other side. And data scientists is somewhere in the middle. They may not understand the problems, the renewable energy problems we are trying to solve really well, but they have the techniques down to be able to solve those problems. And they may not know best software engineering practices. They may never have used AWS or cloud or anything, but they're somewhere in that continuum of skills. So going back to who do we need to hire to be able to have continuity between a set of students who just graduated and the new set of students who come in, you can think about this whole skill set in three, three different domains. One is computer science, the other is domain expertise, and the third is math. Right? And I'm particularly focused on ML-based stuff, so that's what math. Right? And if you find somebody at the intersection of computer science and domain expertise, you get a software engineer. If you find somebody at the intersection of computer science and math, you've got a really good machine learning engineer, may not understand what the problem is, but you've got somebody who understands those techniques. And then you have somebody who gets the math, and somebody who has the domain expertise, they understand the problem really well, and they are your research engineer. The question is, the problem is we need somebody in the middle. So can anybody tell me the job title of what the person in the middle is called? CEO. <laughs> Unicorn. <laughs> And we can't, so we can't find them. So how do we, we have to create them, right? And how do you create them? You have this research organization. 
in that research organization, you have a few engineers, and you got to cross skill, right? You got to try to build the skills into the same system, not go out in the uh, same person, and not go out and find all those skills in one person. Because what happens when you go out and find all the skills in the same person? You do a crazy job description. We've done this, right? And what happens is you lose out on really good candidates, right? Candidates who maybe didn't, you know, grow up with Kafka, right? Playing with Kafka, but you know, candidates who could learn it. And we, we tend to miss out on those candidates. The question is, like, we have to build a balanced team. So I'm going to skip all the heartache that we had in building the team and talk about the team that we actually have today that we built. And the team composition looks something like this. We have six researchers. They are domain experts. They know the problems in renewable energy. They know how to increase renewable energy on the electricity grid and have 100% clean energy for all. They understand math deeply to be able to solve those problems. They have three software engineers who can somewhat speak the language and understand what needs to be built, but are experts in AWS. They are experts in Kubernetes, Docker. They know how to build systems that require little maintenance and can scale a lot compared to the maintenance they require. We have three entry-level engineers, and I want to talk a little bit about that, because that's the key component of all of this. That's what makes it work. We have some administrative staff members, and we have those students who come and go. So what's so special about the entry-level engineers? Well, let's talk about the structure of the team first. So we have researchers and software engineers. You kind of combine them, you get research engineers, but that's not exactly true. What happens is, if you hire really curious entry-level software engineers, they will ask questions and not fear to be the person who asks the dumb questions. They will ask the dumb questions to the mathematicians, to the research engineers, and to the software engineers. And they would be the first ones to acquire the language that allows communication flow to happen bidirectionally between software engineering and research And that was critical to me. Um, I use this, um, so, so, so those are the three entry level engineers. I use this slide a lot. Because uh, this is a good team to me. This is a good team composition. <laughs> Take any layer apart, and the thing doesn't just doesn't work. Um, so that's so that's what you need to build. You need to build the burger team, right? Um, so that's building the team. Going on to building the technology, and I'm going to be overly reductive in this slide because this slide was designed to executives, and we all know they don't understand. <laughs> Not. So. so <laughs> So I'm going, to, I'm going to risk being overly reductive and say there's three things you need to be able to build the technology such that for research organizations who are working with machine learning based research particularly can have the continuity going from one set of students to another set of students. And the first thing you need to do is you want to build in the cloud. Why? Because you don't want to wait. But you don't want to wait. You want things on demand. You need them when you need them. And you want to be able to create environments, just like we heard. You want to be able to create environments at run time on demand for the people who are doing the work. The other thing we didn't want to do is we didn't want to ask permission, right? Because then you have to ask the permission, and we didn't want to wait to get the answer. And then we didn't want to have meetings with IT. Anybody from IT here? I apologize. Your IT is way better than ours. <laughs> and then we didn't want to wait. And so we build things in the cloud. So what did we build in the cloud? We have all our data acquisition systems and aggregation systems up, uh, running in the cloud. I'm going to go here. So AWS is our choice cloud. All of our data acquisitions and aggregation systems are running in the cloud. We have stream data analytics, batch analytics running in the cloud. We have this uh, concept called polyglot persistence that allows us to take a particular set of data, ingest it, and store it in different database formats. So we have the same CSV file going on S3, we have it going in MySQL, we have it going in NoSQL, we have it in graph database, Neo4j, if it applies to that use case. And if it is time series data, we have it in Influx also. And that allows us to dispatch our queries to a particular database that allows lowest latency for that particular type of query that we are trying to run. So that was an incredible complex thing that we had to do, but all of that is in there. Uh, we obviously have visualization um, applications, and we have this on-demand environment wherein a new data scientist or a software engineer coming into the team could go in, request the infrastructure they need that replicates the environment that is being used by all the other developers. So this gives them their EC2 instance, their Jupyter notebooks, all the libraries are pre-installed. Uh, there's, there's a particular library that Stanford developed around convex optimization that we use a lot. Terrible to install. Terrible, terrible mm -hmm. library to install. And now it's just done. There is a simulation tool that they get along with their environment. Uh, it's called GridLab D. It's 
the most used open source grid simulation tool in the world. It was developed by Pacific National uh, uh, Lab. And this tool used to take anywhere from two to four hours to install if you knew how to do it. <laughs> and now it takes under 20 minutes and you have your own instance of GridLabD. And that's the power of having on-demand computing. So these are the things I, uh, we did. Like I said, it's an executive level talk, but I'll be happy to geek out in the Q&A session if you want to. A lot of this code was written by me. Um, so that's the second part. So we talked about building cloud. Second thing was no proprietary software. Why? We didn't want to pay license fees. We are, we, we were, when we started doing this, we were not a big group, and we didn't have a lot of money, and we didn't want to pay Microsoft, let's just say. So we decided uh, no proprietary software. Uh, it's easier to find open source talent. It's easier to find support in the open source community. And I just find people generally more helpful in online forums when you're working with open source technology. Uh, a side benefit of that was it allowed us to standardize Python across all our systems. So Python has huge support across every single technology stack that we were using. And that language standardization is key to allow software engineers and interns and research engineers to be able to communicate amongst each other. Because there's common grounds. Everybody gets Python. If you get people who only work in MATLAB and have them talk to people who only work in Pandas, it's not going to pan out. So that was, that was sort of a side benefit that we found out later. And finally, the third thing in the overly reductive set of three things that we did to build the technology is using GitHub. And my, my best analogy to sort of explain the effect of GitHub is this, right? You have a teenager, and their room looks like this. And you go up to the teenager and say, your girlfriend or boyfriend is coming over. And the room looks like this. <laughs> and that's what happens with GitHub, right? You put everything out there so anybody can see it, and suddenly you start wanting to document stuff. You don't want to be judged on how you know, messy your code is. And you start you know, incrementally cleaning it up to the point where your room now looks like this. So that, that was sort of the next big advantage. Um, so in summary, how do you provide continuity to research and development in research organizations that are primarily working in software? You do this, you build a team, you use cloud, you use open source, and you use GitHub. And that's my talk. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? So, and when there's uh, different students working on different projects, they must have different terminologies for the things they're working on, like different fields in their data. And so forth. So, is there some method used to standardize the metadata to describe the data? Um, yes, we have several methods that we use. We have uh, cheat sheets that we they go through. They understand this, but there's a bigger problem, particularly in energy systems and computer science. And the problem is around nomenclature. The issue is not they don't understand each other's terms. The issue is they both use the same terms and they have different meaning. Mm -hmm. Let me take an example. Infrastructure to me is computers and network, right? Infrastructure and electricity is lines and poles and transformers and substations. Storage to me is somewhere where you store your data. Storage to them is a battery system, right? <laughs> it's, and this just, it's pervasive, because electricity network, it's a network, right? And, computer, and computing is a network. And they have exactly the same terms. So there is, there, yeah, there, there is a little bit of a learning curve there, not just from the perspective of actually getting down to the metadata level and having descriptors and everything else, but even in the language, so we can get them talking. Such that they use the terms knowing what the other people and that does take time. Like I don't have a simple answer for that, but it comes comes over time. Okay. Well, one more. This might be a hard question. Answer. So you talk about having the code in public GitHub. What is the workflow for actually implementing an implementer change? Like, how would you take? You know, you want to make some change to the EC2 instance or whatever it is you want to change. How does that go from concept? to actual implementation of AWS? Absolutely, I think that's a great question. So the, let me take you to sort of the genesis block, so to say. I also do block chains. Uh, <laughs> the genesis block looks like this. You basically have a uh, you know, desktop or a laptop system, and everybody's developing on it. The next step up is maybe this servers and central you know, IT-provided infrastructure, and you have stuff in there. And moving people from there to EC2 is the first step. right? Moving people from there to AWS is the first step. And what you generally do is, you don't really get them to go to AWS management console. You set up the accounts, you set up the infrastructure, you have them, here's your SSH key, here's the IP address, go to your stuff. Now, the challenge comes in when somebody's developing and now they have to check in code or do integration. Uh, 
And what we did, we used Circle TI. And that was a big, big change. And it was primarily the responsibility of the software engineers to enforce that process. What we did at the same time was we had 10 minute standups instituted the moment we decided to go on the call. And those 10 minute uh, standups served two purposes. One, people started developing appreciation for what the other person does and what they bring to the table. And also, sort of a tool discovery. Oh, this functionality exists. Like, there is a thing called Circle CI. Oh, I can do a pipeline and automatically deploys my stuff to that environment. And in the in 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 doing so, tests what is my uh, checks what my test coverage is. By the way, what is a test coverage to a research scientist? Nothing. It means nothing to them. So you start implementing tools slowly and uh, slowly. But the first three things we did were EC2, GitHub, and CI/CD. And CICD took maturation over time. It still changes a little bit. The level of rigor that we apply to that process is a lot better now than it was there to begin with. But um, I think you slowly develop you know, you know, people into that skill set. And uh, they start appreciating the value of, value of what that tool brings. That's my short answer to, you, to your question. We use about 20 or so services in AWS right now. And I'm happy to sort of bring any of my developers here or research, computer, the research engineers, and they know all. Uh, can you share a little more details on the kind of research applications that are being uh, done on this infrastructure by the students or the researchers? Absolutely. So uh, <clears throat> let me talk about an algorithm that we finished recently. It won an R&D 100 award. It's called solar disaggregation. And the fundamental idea is, um, let me actually part that thought. I, I think we need to start in a different place. Um, the utility has to supply you power. And the, the way for them to supply power is to buy this power from generators, right? It could be a nuclear power plant, coal, renewable, hydroelectric, whatever. They have to purchase this power and make sure they have this power to be able to provide to you. Now, they do that at day ahead prices. They purchase power at day ahead prices, which means they have to have some understanding of how much electricity you would use the next day, all of us, right? And to understand how much electricity all of us would use the next day, you have to understand how much electricity each one of us will use the next day. And to be able to do that, the data point that, that utilities have is meter data. right? And you can see a meter reading. You can kind of see how much you used yesterday, look at the weather patterns, look at the seasonality. This day last year, how much did you use? Has the number of people living in your house changed? So on and so forth. And you do load prediction. And you figure out, roughly speaking, how much electricity you would need tomorrow, and they buy it at day ahead prices. Now, if they fall short, in California, what happens is they have to purchase that electricity day ahead, same day price. And that's typically much more expensive. Plus, the only way to produce electricity fast is to burn coal. And it's the same with human body, carbohydrates. Right? Like it's all carbon-based electricity. You, have to, you want quick energy, that's the way to get it. right? And that's typically characterized as dirty energy. Don't ask Trump administration, but we think that's dirty energy. And that dirty energy, you have to pay additional taxes in California. So 1% improvement in load prediction in California is about $100 million. So this is a lot of money at stake. The question is, why is that hard to do if you have all these data sets? It's hard because now there is more and more solar panels coming on, on rooftops. And what happens is when you have a solar panel, you use the generation that happened on the solar panel, you use that electricity, and you use the rest from the grid. So your meter does not accurately show how much you use. right? And if utility has only a meter reading and doesn't know how much solar generation happened, they would always underbuy electricity and have to pay these taxes the next day. And we wrote an algorithm called solar disaggregation that basically takes your net meter reading signal and source separates it into two signals, generation and, and total load. So it's fundamentally like if, if I give you a number seven, you are able to tell if it's five minus two, Right or or, or not, not, oh, sorry five plus two or nine, uh, nine minus two like you can you can tell that right you're separating the sources and that's solar disaggregation to to be able to do that we have to get meter data from all the homes that we are trying to predict uh, load from and these streams of data comes from utility APIs typically so there's many many streams just in pg and territory these could be many many streams and these these are like lots of small files we we call it LOI. So lots of small files come in. They go into S3 bucket. They park themselves briefly. We have a CloudWatch instance that's running. It knows that the new file has arrived. It puts a log in CrowdTrail. We trigger an event to pull that particular file. We pipe it into Kinesis. We run some stream analytics to make sure the file contents are correct and the data is validated. 
um, it goes into the polygonal persistence. So based upon the, uh, the, the features that we put on the file, it goes into one or more of those databases. And then we run batch analytics on top of that data and pr provide a visual layer, visualization layer to be able to show that. So, but that's just one algorithm. And that uses this you know, infrastructure. So, like a real non-technical question. Um, two things. You said those, those young engineers are willing to ask questions and, and come up with a language that then allows communication. So that's really essential. That's pretty interesting to me. The other is, like, for example, Student Affairs IT a couple years ago had this really good student-run program where they basically had 18-month students who were there for 18 months and they overlapped by six months. So there was this time where the people were leaving and others were coming in and it was a learning. So that's like a sort of equally non-technical way of, of transferring knowledge. I think that's incredible if you could do that. Our challenge is the graduation dates are like set. Like students graduate, we wait three months, then the next time students come in. It's a little bit tricky. We do have sometimes students who stick around for the summer, and, and we do see a little bit of the effect that you that you are talking about. But I have, uh, in my experience at Slack, found it a little bit difficult to systemize that uh -huh. year from year. Uh -huh. For sure. And then the tools are fantastic. I mean, that's a, whether the overlap or not, those tools are pretty great. Absolutely. Curious what percentage of research groups uh, Slack or uh, Stanford generally are using this overall workflow organization? So it's uh, so we are part of this division called Applied Energy Division, and there are like sort of two prongs to the division. One is that is data science, we work with data, and the other is that works in materials, coming up with new solar materials that have you know better density, better production, generation, etc. So it's I would say our group is sort of the main group that's using it right now. But as more and more database research is happening on the material side, they, we are trying to how do you monitor actual usage and contain costs in the cloud? Uh, so that's that's a great question. So let me just talk about my costs first. So we spend anywhere from two thousand dollars to seven thousand dollars a month on AWS, and that varies primarily because we sometimes have to run analytics over a large region as opposed to just testing and developing of the analytics. So testing and developing are about two to three five hundred ish per month. Uh, how do we contain cost? Uh, the, I have to go a little bit into how money flows in. So we have multiple projects that are funded from US Department of Energy, California Energy Commission, CPUC, et cetera. And money has color for anybody who has worked in research and has to be accounted for. In AWS, we use tags that are associated with infrastructure that a particular um, resource is uh, tied to. And then we do a, you know aggregation on those tags and be able to divvy up the money and everybody puts into that pool. Uh, so that's the accounting part of it. How do we control the costs? Um, we, we basically have flags, so we have CloudWatch running, and, we, if, if, and there's certain thresholds that we have set for each of the developer, particularly for developer environments, and then for each of our production, it's not production, it's all integration environments for us. Um, all of the integration environments, if any of those you know, thresholds are crossed, then we'd be an IGAP notified and most of our coworkers get so like that. Do you, do you uh, store data over, is, I'm wondering if the data that you have is continually building up as you have more and more data and if, you, if it's being archived and the volume is getting larger and larger and the cost is getting larger and larger, is that? Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. We did have to sort of uh, address this ourselves. Uh, if you, the type of work that we do, two years data is more than sufficient for us to do prediction over the next year. Then the way uh, climate change affects weather and the weather patterns have been changing, they don't tend to go back two years to two year back patterns. They kind of continue along the curve that they are going, and last year, two years worth of data is typically enough for us to do trending seasonality, et cetera, you know, type of uh, pa um, pattern detection. So we purge the data when it's two years old, or we you know, put it in glitch. We don't really keep it in S3 or any of our databases. And S3 is not as expensive. It's having five copies of the data in, in the worst case scenario in the polycloud persistence layer. That gets very, very expensive. So we definitely move it out of there. Couple more questions. Well, I'm just curious again. Uh, how, how, uh, is the work on the work GPU dependent? Or uh, not, n not so far. There's just one thing that we have done that is in. It's quite impressive and largely used GPU infrastructure. Was it's called Deep Solar, and effectively we used uh, satellite image data to be able to detect all the solar installed solar all across the United States, and be able to have an estimation of uh, generation capacity of all of that rooftop installed solar. Okay. And that was, um, I think that was thirty thousand dollars, just one run, and that was it. We didn't do it after because we had, we got the data that we needed. Yeah. Questions? 
come around if you want to come over and go to Geek Hub more. Uh, thank you all. Great, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, again, our next cloud meetup will be in one month on the last Tuesday of that month. So, the cloud we'll see all your faces there. Thank you. <laughs>